What's up, everybody? Welcome back for part two of our Aged Out reactions with the one and only Tom Rarick. I know if you just finished watching the first one, we released these one day apart. So thanks for coming and checking out part two. Comment, subscribe, share, you know, you guys know the drill. LoneStarPercussion.com, discount code Aged Out. Save yourself $10 or $50 or more. Uh, social media, podcast services, Patreon.com for any financial support you want to throw our way. All right. So this was supposed to be all part of one video, but we just had too much to say and too much just information. Just too good. It's it was too, too good. good. So we said, let's break this into two. So today we're looking at 2015 Bluecoats and 2014 Bluecoats. Uh, another two other iconic years from that ensemble. Um, of course, arranged percussion-wise by uh, Mr. Rarick here with us. And uh, Drum Corps Tube is the channel we got both of these from. So appreciate it. Uh, all oh, right. I'm hyped. It's good. Yep. Yeah, we're gonna do 15 first. I think that this book is so tasty. Oh, just, it's great. I love it. Should have won a drum trophy. Hot take. <laughs> <That's> hot. <laughs> Pretty hot. One in 15. BD? I don't want to talk about it. It's always BD. Ruel. What a great quote on mine, too. Yeah. Oh. If you can find it, dudes that can play, I think that that's the best balance to the snare line. But that roll. Yeah. I love the bass roll so good. Dude, especially with this like double stop front front ensemble stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about this. Da, 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 Stop after the tech teacher. Yes. Uh, dude, all that just like. Yeah. I'm trying to find a place to pause, but it just keeps <laughs> one great moment right into another great moment. It's just like. I all guess those I'm, like crossovers to, feeding into the yeah. remember run. I was trying to compartmentalize all the speaking parts of that because like the kinetic noise part of that was like this like. Like the vibe of that whole thing is like a one of those like '60s like science videos of like narrating like, or just it's like a black and white video like and and a, and a narration behind it. So like the the source material was a tune called uh, the animated description of Mr. Maps, which I have no idea what that means, but it's by the books, um, and it's really cool. It uses like uh, voice and rhythm and that kind of thing together, and that's where that all came from. But that was really um, that was an interesting process to put that together, like to write things to like what you imagine the voice might be, you know, like all that tenor stuff. Normally, where right. is this very long? All that, you know, like all that stuff had a vocal inflection to it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the bass drums. Um, it was kind of like it didn't wasn't supposed to mean anything in terms of like the text, like of the words. It was supposed to be like this kind of like kind of monotone, like chatter that like colored the the rhythms of the battery. So and that was interesting too, because the front ensemble, like, we, um, um, it was an interesting thing for the front ensemble, like, because most of the music we played was based on minimalist composers or like minimalist kind of ideas. Like, there was Steve Reich at the beginning, uh, a couple things layered together, and then, um, just like repetitive type things that were really essential to the music, but they weren't, they were like, they did, did a great job of providing like a bed of kind of like sound and rhythm and color and and all those things for things to solo over top of. So it's literally what percussion is supposed is normally supposed to be. It's an accompaniment instrument usually. Right? Yeah. So it's yeah, just one of those fun years of just exper again experimenting with kind of voice and roles and that kind of thing within the percussion ensemble. So I also just realized with these hybrid videos, and I have to apologize to anyone that was in this front or wants to watch the front, because I have all of our video overlays in the bottom of the screen, and the front ensemble video is the bottom of the screen. So <laughs> I just looked We're at the screen capture window. I'm not sure there's any front ensemble podcasts, so they'll be happy just to be heard. <laughs> I think maybe at, at this point, but I mean, we shouldn't stop there. Oh, yeah, man. Absolutely. So maybe we should start one. We should start one. Yeah, you know we we've we, we've thrown some ideas around about front ensemble guard and and brass land involved with drum corps, but we'll we'll That's talk about idea. that later. Uh, <laughs> talk, yeah. All right, 
I'm gonna back up because we just paused like in the yeah. middle of a cool phrase. So we're gonna go to the end of the quad feature. This book, uh, so consistent. this book sounds like it feels so good in the hands. Oh, great isolated tags over the bass runs and the bass moment. I remember writing this part. Like, <laughs> totally, like... Tom Hannum, like, like that, that's what I thought of. Not that it sounds like Tom Hannum, but like, out to the edge, cross stick, press, like, really detailed in terms of, like, note lengths and that kind of stuff. Amber changes all over the place. Exactly. That's totally inspired by, by him. So good. Here you go. Just, cross yeah, I was gonna say, where's the cross sticks? Also, yeah. shout out to the overlay and the front ensemble and battery playing in time in separate locations. I know. And no Matt, I don't think in either location. Hey, no you got Matt. the in-ear monitors, right? The in-ear monitors before it was. Uh... You're, you're, you're after this. <laughs> you didn't start cheating until 2016. Gotcha, gotcha. That's a joke, everybody. <laughs> you know that's gonna be the top comment with a thousand likes on this video. Just. We didn't start cheating until 2016. <laughs> yeah, it's, all good. It, it's so consistent. Like, it's just all good. Battery. Is phenomenal. The whole ensemble is insane. Didn't you guys get like a 99 something or 19 something like finals night? It was high. I think we were on the field. I think it was a 19.9 or something. I think. Uh, this is still perk one, perk two. Yeah. I mean, they were definitely worthy. I'm not saying anybody else wasn't. It was, they were excellent. All hey, it's a baby Kyle. It is. Kyle with long hair. Yeah. Armando, he's in the green jumping floor now. Better there. Oh. Um, I'm... Ben, ben Hydrick there. Yeah. What's it, Pearl? Aaron Bailey. Aaron yep. Bailey. I Mike, was playing poker Mike with Davis. him last night. Every single one. <laughs> Superstars. These guys. It's a hell of a drum line. I want to back up because yeah. that phrase was too clean. Hold on. It starts like right here, I think. Woo! Threes. Threes. I'm not sure I'd write that nowadays. So aggressive. The bill. that show it's so sure. good that's probably it's such a I, phenomenal show thank you which um this is not tilt right no tilt was 14 what we're about to no, watch this is kinetic noise yes, we're thank just you about this. look okay i get those the, both years were great i get them mixed up in my brain i'm not the drum corps historian uh, I, I we've am. said this on this podcast all the time i'm terrible about that but I mean, uh similar like influences in, in a way fair but I at 15 was nuts. They were so good. Yeah, that was um, that was a lot of fun. I remember like being very like insecure about like that like during the winter. Like like what are we doing? Like I don't know what this show means, <laughs> or what this is, or nobody's gonna like it. So we're coming from something that was so obvious. Like in tilt, it was a concept show. It was like mm -hmm. okay, I get it. Things tilt, music tilts, yep. pitch bend, all that kind of thing, and then. You know, it was a little bit more more abstract of an idea. I put um, I put tilt in the is... category of shows like Evan and I have talked about on here tons, touch and gone that X did in 08 and 09. Like a lot of those shows that are just very simple, obvious concepts that you can do a million things with work yep. so well in this activity, and tilt is a prime example of that, in my opinion. And I, yeah, I honestly, we segue. Go ahead. No, finish here. No, no I'm done. No, go, go ahead. I was gonna say before we segue though to that. I was going to say with this 15 show, especially in like in the opener and stuff, there was a lot of like motif you did with just like those like trailing eighth notes, like some very just yeah. subtle crescendos, decrescendos. 
was that something that you just kind of like thought of when you were writing? It's like, I'm going to make so, this a thing. I'm so glad you asked this question. <laughs> you, have, you have no idea how glad I am that you asked this. So I like that. So are you familiar with Electric Counterpoint, the Steve Reich like piece that's like, it's in, it's in three movements. One that everybody- I'm not, but I'll probably go no. look it up now. You should go yeah. listen to it after this. Um, Electric Counterpoint. Yep. Uh, Pat Metheny actually recorded it too, or one of the recordings of it. But um, the third movement is the one that's most recognizable. And this, that was the second half of our, our opener. It was that, it's the beetle, beep, but but beetle. But like Mystique did it. It's been, it's the most tuneful, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, the first, the first movement of that is all built on eighth notes. And it has like a, um, uh, I'm not sure if the correct term would be phase kind of piece, but it's like a phase dynamics almost where it like, it's like these stacked harmonic values and then they kind of change in term, terms of like dynamic priority and they kind of fade away and kind of reappear and fight. So that's what's all that's kind of built upon or inspired by was, so if you listen to some of the battery stuff, it like starts low, travels up and then like the bottom drops out and then you're left with like some of the, just the treble notes like up top. Right. So it was trying to create that sense of like, you know, again, like harmonic kind of quality through the battery or just like, you know, leading from a textural standpoint that way. Right. Right. The, yeah. uh, the actual tune that we played that against was it's another, it's John Adams. I think it's Phrygian Gates, I believe. Not Virgin Gates. Uh, I forget. The guy from Yes did a cover of it, like the, the vocalist John Anderson, I believe. He did a cover of a John Adams piece that I'm totally blacking on right now. Not Virgin Gates. I'm it's something else. In a second while you're talking. Yeah. But um, but so that was the the melody over top of that. But underneath that, we do that a lot, I guess. At Blue Coats, we like there's a piece of music we like, but then we figure out like what we can layer with it or what influences you bring from a different. A different piece of music that kind of work with it or can change the complexion of it to make it fit what we're going for or can determine what we're going for you know depending on how that works out as well so that's i mean i love that backstory i mean from an outsider obviously in a spectator probably on like i would say like one or two in-person listens like yeah. i just always appreciated the the balance that it created like of listening to a full ensemble go from one dynamic contrast to the other with just this like subtle crescendo and then like you're saying like the bottom fall falls out and you're left with just this other timbre it's almost like in my mind listening to uh, a horn line do a tuning sequence and like everybody drops out except for like that one section and then, then we rebuild back in and i was just like ooh, this is this make this warms my soul can you guys hear this if it's playing right, right now, no. To, I can't hear it yet. Okay. Sorry, you can edit that out. <laughs> no. I, hey, I can't. I cannot edit as much out, no, believe it or not, with the video recording as I can oh, with the audio. Uh, oh, and again, I'll recover gracefully. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's move on. We mentioned tilt earlier. We are going to get into tilt for a quick four-minute clip, and then wrap this sucker up. So, also, I think tilt and. And uh, Kinetic Noise are my two favorite, probably, Blue Coat shows, I would say. The, in 2015, the, two, the tunes were Shaker Loops, Electric Counterpoint, Shaker Loops. Woods. That's the, yep. okay. there it That's is. The, the John Adams tune that John Anderson did a vocal cover of. There it, it is. It was the vocalist from Yes. So there you go. Boom. All right. And then listen to the first movement of Electric Counterpoint. Well, oh, actually, well. the whole piece, but... Not yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Not just the third movement. Shaker loops. All right. Here we go. Now here's some pit action. It'll probably disappear to the bottom of the screen soon, but... Ramos. Yep. yep. Tommy Rome. This is all pre show stuff. Connor uh, is in this as well. There he is. Connor teaches the serums. So what I'm doing here. Connor does a lot of the tuning.
That was a great way to get the hands moving. Yeah. All that, like get the hands warmed up, like through all that intro stuff. Damon playing snare drum. <laughs> Dude, those double verticals in the Marimba's oh. they were getting up there. Hold on. I want to back up for a second. Woo. The roll from the edge that moved to the center with left hand left hand lead putted us. Not smart, but they played it really well. It worked. It did. Dante's here. Yeah. I love that though. Uh, name of that phrase. This is a really fun year to come out like this. Like, you know, 2013 was cool, but it was kind of transitional in a lot of ways, like staff and members and all that. And, like, He's trying not to smile so show. hard. They're so strong. <laughs> oh, look, look at Ollie. So that's, that's from so the hard. original piece of music. <laughs> yeah, we did a podcast with him where we talked about that, like being from the original piece and yeah. him saying like how it came to be of him actually being the one to do it. He said it wasn't him but, initially. I honestly I forget. I mean I, I wrote it I wrote it in the snare staff and then I didn't know who was gonna get it. It was like up to John Vandercoff right in the drill, like whoever was left. Well, I think he, I think he said it was a quad sense. player had it initially or something because the way the drill worked out, and Maybe. then they changed yeah. it and he was like, "Oh, hey, that snare drummer." It's like, "All right, cool, I get a solo now." <laughs> that sounds familiar. He just lucked into it. The, the original piece is called Ufi's Wood Chop. It's by mm -hmm. Hyundai Braxton, and it has like this, you know, has like a wood chopping kind of thing, like ding, do ding, do ding, do ding. So that's that's there. So it was not really comedy, but maybe levity or just something in there. Whatever's one notch below kind of comedy in terms of percussion. Dude, all the texture in the front and layer it over top of that. Wood blocks, temple blocks. like better than a long snare roll right? it works and you put the stabs over top of it in the front yeah. it's just like it's so effective yeah see i know pit things People those are stabs right pit. absolutely I'm, <laughs> i guess that's a good uh go ahead evan if you're, if you're talking i was just gonna say i guess that's a good opportunity like talking about like arranging in opportunities are there certain points where you're just have a certain vibe in your head or a certain voicing in your head. Like, I know that this is probably maybe going to be a snare dominated moment in the battery yeah. and I'll facilitate the other parts around it. Or is it always just like the front's going to do this and then I'll facilitate everything else around it or vice versa. Like I know that I wanted this to be a battery moment and I'll facilitate the front around it. Sure. I mean, having the luxury of like kind of taking, choosing that myself and just, just being me here looking at a chart and doing that. Um, it's usually either or, like it's and it varies by section of the show. Things that are more like impact oriented or like kind of rhythmic or full out from the brass are usually more battery driven, maybe like the the rhythmic structure of that stuff, like whatever feels good and is gonna I think fill up those spaces or drive those moments a little bit more. Um just in, so I would usually maybe write the battery first in those moments and then kind of and then then think about like what a keyboard line would be and then what kind of colors like fill that in and what kind of like feeling we're creating with all that. And then there's compromise in that too. It's like, okay, there's something that feels too metric to feel like a natural keyboard part. Then maybe it's time to change what the battery does. So it's not like a five lit into triplet kind of thing that doesn't really apply to a keyboard thing, maybe in a natural sense, you know, mm -hmm. uh, other times that, you know, Makes I think sense. it's just a matter of each section of the show. Like, 
I keep a little chart and just kind of like plot in like kind of main voice, anything that kind of identifies that in terms of like, like, like a color. Like you heard like wood blocks in there. Like you mentioned that Evan going through there. It's like with the snares or just like coming like this, this section feels like wooden and snares and like trebly, that kind of thing. Or there's uh, lower sounds and metal, and like more sustained, that kind of thing that just, I think textures or ideas that kind of guide you through a piece, like that's helpful to have. And then there's also just like when you listen to something you get from the brass arranger or just like a section of music you have to write and you go, all right, that phrase feel like, I know what I want to do there. Like no matter what, it just like there's right. invariably there's like one mm -hmm. thing that speaks to you and you just kind of go boom and write that. And then whatever ha ends up happening in there usually kind of informs what happens on either side of that as well. Like, okay, I did this little thing here. Like, I like this, like, the way the left hand feels in this, like, to get about boom or whatever it is. And then maybe that makes an appearance or some kind of abstraction or, like, and maybe that's only for you. But, like, it's just something that gives you a foothold in the arrangement. And then you kind of, like, you can move that around or just, like, have a reference point or just it's part of your, one of the colors you paint with without sounding too pretentious about it. But... Um, it's about kind of oh, establishing sure. those. Like, I like the color you're, reference. You're pull from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. It's funny, like watching this too. Like I, how my writing has changed. I really haven't watched this stuff in a long time. But just like it's, I feel like it's more battery centric than it is now. Which is, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's wrong. I don't know. It just it feels that way. Maybe it's because the battery's mixed a little hot in this stuff too. But I would never say wrong. Maybe just evolved like over time like yeah. the activity itself has evolved like it would make sense that someone who's been writing for 20 years like their writing would evolve because the activity itself has evolved like what the horn line's doing what the color guard's doing what the props are what the soundscape sure. is i mean it's just all it's yeah. evolved i mean i think that's what makes like the the guys like you or the people like you at the top that do the arranging for this stuff at the top like you have to change with the times. Like as the activity evolves and the shows are different year to year to year, the writing and arranging demand is going to change. Like you can't approach every show that's a completely different show with the same sure. writing approach. Like you're, it's the show's going to kind of dictate. And that's what that's what Unks, McNutt, you. I know Scott Johnson doesn't write BD stuff except for like the features or random parts. I think, but all the people at the top of this and in the brass too. Like you just have to listen to the show and the music a little bit and whatever whatever works is what you have to go with and you got to be dynamic and yeah. open to trying something different if you need to. And I think like, you do a good thing, job of it like the rest of them. The other thing is like what Roger does with the battery and just like the whole program and how it evolves, like which the stuff they do like on a, you know, the, the lot tunes they do and not tunes, but the etudes and that kind of thing that they spend a lot of time on. And it's, it's great. It builds a vocabulary and like they, it's, great stuff and inspires me too. And that like, you, you see like little things that they do like two or three years later, like what Roger will write it like in the parking lot for their <laughs> the stuff they'll, they'll do. And then it's like, then I'll kind of like learn like some of it and it'll like leak into my kind of, you know, like how I play a little bit. Yeah. And then that comes out in the writing a little bit and that, that, and that's fun for me. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. We're never done evolving and learning. Yep. Dude, that's a game. This part too. This is the IP ones out the edge. Right, you're right. The little like yep. five stroke singles and rolls. Yep. It was just the whole like they came through the core at that point, like visually, like in the <laughs> final, like, total tonality change and modulation when they came in. It was one of my favorite parts. Tommy Rome always makes fun of me for this part. <laughs> he said it was perfect, but he also acknowledges how simple it was. This whole phrase built so well. Uh, macro phrasing. Yep. Room for 
for error uh, just because the marimba's established that 16th note phrase and then the battery like builds in after they're already established mm -hmm. it's like better be perfect ensemble yeah. timing it's tough yeah i know i i tend to write a lot of things like that <laughs> <laughs> Go big or uh, go home. I mean, I'm glad I don't have to clean it on a daily basis, I guess. <laughs> like a lot of those things. But even the tenor stuff there, you saw like it was like paired little diddle stuff like on the grid of the 16th and then it would like go into triplet roll stuff. It was not all the same roll base, but they, you know, so it's not even like about hearing the space too. It's just like kind of, you, you just like hold on at certain points and like hope that it kind of lines up. So... <laughs> yeah. Sounds good in my head, guys. Figure it out. Yeah, it's like I just see Tom write, yeah. he writes it down and goes... Have fun with that one, guys. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's at a certain point you have to because, like, whatever I can dream up here, like in my studio here, like, I mean, they're capable of more for sure. Yeah, it's just a matter of finding what's smart and you know, and doable and and all that. So it's the name yeah. of the game. Fun process. Nope. And, That's cool. Fortunately, too, I'm sure. Fortunately for you and everybody else out there in the arranging game, the level of student makes the capabilities just almost endless it seems just like Absolutely. they can do so much yeah it's funny it's, it's not like the prospect of being like presented with your own stuff like six years later on youtube and on a podcast it's literally like it's this the student you have to hand the music to and go okay this is your summer you know like that's <laughs> that's the real thing it's like yeah you know, that's obligation but not that this isn't real but we actually don't. Um, exist, no, I totally so. get it. <laughs> they, keep, they keep getting better and demanding more and more of of me and people like me who who write and and people who teach and that's the way it should be. It's yeah. great. Absolutely. So, well, cool. Me. All right. Now we are officially done. There's no part three yet. We might down the road. We'll see. Uh, was I in video? Was I in video this time? Or yes, you were actually on video <laughs> this entire time. I did not forget it. Uh, if you've not seen part one, <laughs> go watch part one because. I'm basically bad at the tech part of this still. I'll learn eventually. All right. Get, thanks, everybody. We're, we're figuring it out. <laughs> yeah. We're getting there one video at a time. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out. Check out uh, LoneStarPercussion.com. Discount code aged out. Check out the podcast, uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram. You all know the drill. We will see you all in the next one. Peace. Thanks, guys.